He's traveled to the edges of the earth and uncovered the natural phenomena of our past. Now, author Simon Winchester takes us to the world's largest ocean as the subject of his new book, Pacific, Silicon Chips and Surfboards, Coral Reefs and Atom Bombs, Brutal Dictators, Fading Empires, and the Coming Collision of the World's Superpowers. I'm out of breath. And we welcome Simon Winchester back to TV. Who came up with that subtitle? Well, I, I, I'm sort of embarrassed by it. In Britain, it's called Pacific, the Ocean of the Future. Australia, I think it's Pacific Ocean of Tomorrow. But the Americans, and I'm sorry to say the Canadians as well, have this portmanteau subtitle, and it is purely for people doing Google searches. So if you search silicon chips or if you search brutal dictators, my book will come up. Nothing to do with me at all. Marketing, man. Marketing. Marketing. Ends. Okay. Let's start with this. Uh, I'm just going to read some of the stats that I learned in your book here, namely that the Pacific that we're talking about. Let's bring this up if we can, Sheldon. An area that covers almost 166 million square kilometers. That's almost a third of the planet's surface. It's 45% of the planet's total water surface. 11 kilometers down are the Earth's deepest trenches. And it traces the northern tip of the Pacific to the south. That is a distance of more than 14,000 kilometers. I must say, as I was reading this, one of the things I found most fascinating is that given how utterly important, essential, the Pacific is to this planet, why has no one written this book before you? Well, it's funny you should say that, actually, because someone has written it before, and that was me. I wrote another <laughs> book about the Pacific when I lived in Hong Kong in the 1990s called Pacific Rising. It was comprehensively ignored by everybody. Okay. So it was not a success. But you're right. I mean, there are very few books. There are a few books about the Atlantic. Maybe I think there's one academic book about the Indian Ocean. But the Pacific, the biggest, I mean, a behemoth of eye-watering mm. complexity, and yet no one has really tackled it. Do you have any theories as to why that would be? It makes no sense that we would ignore something that vast. I, in many ways, because when we do write books about the Pacific, it's Asia Pacific. And people look at the Western Pacific. You look at China, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia. But you don't look at the one, authors don't look at the Pacific as a whole. And I can sort of see why and sympathize, because it is, it's pretty daunting. It is so enormous and it, it, it covers societies and peoples that are so astonishingly different from one another. I mean, a, you know, a rancher in Arizona is, is hugely different from a, a stockbroker in Peking. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a challenge. Uh, it is an ocean of superlatives, as we'll read in this excerpt. It is the oldest of the world's seas, the relic of the once all-encompassing Panthalassic Ocean that opened up 750 million years ago. It is by far the world's biggest body of water. All the continents could be contained within its borders, and there would be ample room to spare. It is the most biologically diverse, the most seismically active. It sports the planet's greatest mountains and deepest trenches. Its chemistry influences the world, and the planetary weather systems are born within its boundaries. Okay, lots to unpack here. Uh, the storms created in the Pacific are harbingers for the weather for the rest of the planet. Explain. Well, we're seeing it now. I mean, we have this El Nino, which is getting underway now, and already we're seeing ferocious rainstorms and mudslides you saw like the, recently in Los Angeles. The, the whole weather pattern for the, the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra is changing, uh, not before time, of course, because they've had these terrible droughts in California. Um, the patterns of the weather in the Pacific were largely uncovered by this extraordinary man called Gilbert Walker, who was a meteorologist in India, who was really fascinated by the mechanics of boomerangs, which is why he's known to this day as Boomerang Walker. Hmm. Despite being a sort of risible British eccentric, he was a master statistician and was fascinated by the monsoon and its failure. And he came up with this idea that the wind patterns over the Pacific, what is now known as the Walker Circulation, are the key to all the major weather features in the Pacific, most notably the El Nino. And the El Nino, it is now realized, influences the weather everywhere. So even if you get a, an Atlantic hurricane, which most of those are born in, in West Africa, they're all caused by changes in pressure, which ultimately are born because of the enormous amount of heat poured from the sun into the Pacific mm. Ocean. It's all to do with, and I really do not want to get technical and your viewers will not want me to, but basically it, its size is everything because it absorbs so much heat, so much of the wind and the pressure generated by that heat causes 
turbulence, which is then has a knock-on effect everywhere. So you ignore the Pacific at your peril mm. if you're a meteorologist. Uh, you're, I mean, we know you've written best-selling books, but you're actually a geologist, a geologist, are you not, by training? A failed geologist. Fact, I, mean, yeah. I, I took geology at Oxford. <laughs> I went for a year in Uganda, working oddly enough for a Canadian company, Falcon Bridge of Africa, hmm. and were looking for copper, didn't find a microgram, and got my way into journalism. Well, that's just <laughs> a setup to the following question, which is, don't most people think the big one, the big one, the earthquake, is going to happen as a result of the Pacific? Well, we've seen this remarkable piece by Catherine Schultz in the New Yorker earlier this year about the Cascadia fault, which, if that were to break, and it, it will one day, um, will affect uh, Western Canada horribly, and, and Seattle mm -hmm. and Portland will be devastated by it. So that is the, the big one that we're, as it were, truly apprehensive of, as we are apprehensive of the San Andreas fault. Uh, San Francisco being I'd just like again. to note the date. When is that going to happen? Uh -huh. I wanna, well, I if we knew that, that, we'd get out of Dodge <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> The Pacific as the new frontier, what kind of discoveries are we making there? Well, one, a classic one, was made in, in not so long ago, 20 or 30 years ago, by this wonderful little man submersible called the Alvin, which went down and found these hydrothermal vents. And the, the important thing about these vents of gushing very, very hot water and gases burbling out of the cracks in the bottom of the Pacific is that life forms there. We think of life as essentially run by the process of photosynthesis, that we get sunlight and it chemical reacts, bring energy and so forth. How does life get created in total icy darkness, 10 kilometers down in, in the sea? And it's all to do with, with sulfur, which we never thought had anything to do with life. So the, the ultimate building blocks of life are not sunlight and sugars and proteins that we used to think. That's one source, but there are other sources too in the deep water. And that was the principal discovery made by Alvin in the Pacific. And the other one are these extraordinary amounts of minerals which come out also from these hydrothermal vents, these great pillars known as black smokers, which look like, well, towers hundreds of feet high until they, uh, under their own weight, collapse and fall over made of the sulfides of iron and copper, but also compounds of gold and silver and platinum and iridium, and huge amounts of mineral wealth on the, on the floor of the Pacific. Can it be mined? Should it be mined? That's a big question. Well, there's mm -hmm. one company, Australian company, called Platina, which is lowering deep into the sea over these fields of hydrothermal vents, great digging machines, which are made in factories in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in England, which are going to claw their way through these things and send it up in great rubber tubes to the surface, utterly ruining the bottom of the sea. In my view, it shouldn't be done, mm. but it's going to trigger, I think, a, a very important environmental debate. So life and, if you like, death, both mm. of these things are found on the bottom of the Pacific. As one tries to think about where to start telling the story of the Pacific, something that big, You've decided January 1st, 1950 is the place to start. How come? Eccentric, it's not altogether an eccentric reason, but it has to do with dating. Uh, and I, by that I don't mean going out with the person of the opposite gender. <laughs> I mean um, the use of initially AD and BC. We think, you know, we live in 2015 AD. An event happened in 55 BC. But because we're not all Christians, BC and AD have somewhat fallen out of favour. <laughs> So there's this new dating system, BCE, before Common Era or before Christian Era, or this even more elaborate dating system which the scientific community adopts called BP, before present. Hmm. So you talk about the Wisconsin Ice Age, for instance, as happening 10,000 years BP, but when is present? Well, present is decided by a group of radio chemists as being the 1st of January 1950 because... And once again, I don't want to get technically boring here, but carbon-14 dating mm -hmm. was accurate before 1950 because we knew the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. It was stable. Mm -hmm. But thanks to atomic testing, suddenly the amount of carbon-14, which is a byproduct of atomic bombs, started rocketing. And so the calculations went awry. You had to put in algorithms. So before 1950, the world was pure. After 1950, the world was impure and all to do with testing, which occurred mostly in the Pacific Ocean. So it seemed a good date for me. And why did the United States decide to test its atomic power there? Because of the vast amount of real estate, empty, more or less empty real estate, that the United States acquired 
after the end of the Second World War. These islands in the Western Pacific, thousands of miles of essentially, but not wholly, essentially uninhabited ocean. And they thought, let's choose Bikini, Bikini Atoll, mm -hmm. name, where we get the swimming costume name for, um, 250 miles north uh, east uh, of uh, Kwajalein, which is where the Americans had a big air base, so they could conveniently load the bombs onto B-29s, drop them over Bikini. They evacuated all the people. This cunning, I mean, the, the people who lived on Bikini, we're talking about 1946 now, were Christians. They'd been Christianized by missionaries in the 19th century. So cynically, the American government came to them and said, you remember from, I think, was it Exodus or Leviticus, there's a passage about the Israelites being led behind a column of fire. Mm. Well, we, the Americans, can create a column of fire and we're going to lead you out of your island into exile temporarily while we test these uh, bombs. We test how we can make bigger and better pillars of fire. Mm. And so they started testing the bombs and the poor Bikinians were thrown out. They attempted to go back in the 70s, but they had to leave because the island is still lethally contaminated with radioactive byproducts, and the island's uninhabitable. So there's a legacy of utter ruin. In and these. what's happened to these people? Well, they're living, there's a diaspora of them now spread around the world, but they're mostly in a horrible little island in the southern Marshalls with no airstrip, very little food, and miserable and yearning to go home, but never can. It's a very sad story. What about the impact on the coral reefs in the area? Oh, well... It's odd because Bikini is an atoll. It's a very big atoll of which Bikini Island is one tiny one at the southeast of the atoll. The coral reefs lethally damaged, but still the, because the targets of the early bombs were ships which were sunk. These ships have all sunk in the lagoon. There are 20 or 30 sunken ships, which of course new coral has grown. And so the world's richest divers go there. So Bikini depopulated. No people live there, but $5,000 a day people will go there in dive ships to dive on the ruined warships that were destroyed by the atom bomb tests. It's very topsy-turvy. Let's do some geopolitics here. What kind of implications did the retreat of colonial powers have in the Pacific region? Well, I go into this in, in, in some detail. I mean, the Pacific was from end to end colonized, basically by the British, first of all, if you like, but I mean, the, the Japanese, the Germans, everyone had, the French, of course, still have a lot of colonies. And gradually, in the 70s and 80s, when imperialism was no longer as fashionable as once, we withdrew. And most of the islands have now become self-determining uh, republics and states and a great deal healthier as a result. Some of them still pay fealty to, for instance, the Queen and uh, the Solomon Islands, for instance. But generally speaking, um, the colonialism has, has eased its grip. We've still got Pitcairn Island, the British have, the French have a lot of, of, of territories ruled from Paris. Um, but the Germans have gone, the Japanese have gone, and the Americans, of course, have gone. Um, the Americans, I think one can say that what happened in Vietnam and of course the Philippines, which was an actual American colony, um, that influence has, has, has left. And so the countries are standing on their own two feet, and most of them standing proudly and standing um, with some degree of economic success. So I'm, from a, I'm very keen on Pacific nationalism. I'm glad we, the white people, have gone away and left the Pacific to its own devices. Well, its own devices. Having said that, when we talk geopolitics on this program, we have a lot of experts say that if there's going to be a next great flashpoint for a war in this century, it's going to be the South China Sea, and this is the part of the world that you've just written 500 pages on. So uh, how likely do you think it is that territorial claims in that part of the world are going to result in the next big war? Well, that's a very difficult question, and I spend most of Chapter 10 <coughs> discussing it because it does look alarming, I must say. I mean, the South China Sea, I remember crossing it in a container ship in the 1970s, and you would pass by the, the, the Paracel Islands and the Spratlys, and the captain of the ship would be taking photographs, and then when we reached Hong Kong, we were going from a port in Malaysia, um, a naval intelligence officer would meet the captain and take the pictures because everyone wanted to know what was happening in these islands and what was happening in these uninhabited islands claimed by all sorts of people, 
Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, China, is that the Chinese were saying, clear out of the way, we're going to build. And they've been indulging in this orgy of building. Now there are airstrips, there are docks, there's a small city, I mean, with the hotels and things on a pre previously totally uninhabited uh, coral reef. And the, the view is, in Beijing, is that the South China Sea is no longer international waters, it's Chinese waters. Mm -hmm. And the Americans are saying, like heck it is, we are going to steam warships past your islands and defy you. Well, the only act of defiance in the last year or so was when the Chinese declared an air defense identification zone, an ADIS, over the Senkaku Islands, which are similarly claimed, but they're in the Sea of Japan. And the Americans said, like heck, you're going to do that, and flew two B-52s through the ADIS, and the Chinese did nothing. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is that the Chinese will do nothing in the South China Sea so long as American warships don't try and attack any of these islands. Mm -hmm. And I think the Americans are not foolish enough to do that. But it's tense, and it's getting tenser. Um, the key year is 2049, the 100th anniversary of the forming of the People's Republic of China. And by then, the Chinese will have... They've got one aircraft carrier now. They've ordered four more. They have a hugely competent and ever-expanding navy. Should we feel threatened by that? Well, I don't like to use words like threatened. I think we should be concerned. But the overall point is America has policed the Pacific ever since the end of World War II. It's assumed that an American warship can go anywhere it likes, whether it's the Philippine Sea or whether it's the Aleutians or whether it's off Chile or whether it's off Australia. The Chinese are saying, well, we can do the same. Yeah. Why shouldn't we? And the Americans are getting all antsy about it and saying, well, well, you shouldn't. It's our ocean. And the Chinese are saying, no, it's not. It's the world's ocean. And so by 2049, probably earlier, they will be able to run aircraft carriers off Honolulu, off San Diego. And my view is fine. So long as they don't attack anybody, I don't care where they sail their ships. They should have as much or as little right as the Americans. But in the Pentagon, they take a different view and they do think of confrontation, and of course they want their budgets to increase and the politicians all get steamed up. I hope this book pleads for reasonableness because the Chinese historically have very little by way of territorial ambitions, leaving Tibet aside. Mm. China is not an expansionist nation, but China quite reasonably says, we have pride. We don't want American ships all around the Pacific. We want our presence here to be notable as well. You have posed a fascinating alternate reality to the Kims. Oh. We're talking North Korea here. Let me read this. Many military strategists have speculated that the world might have been a far safer place if post-war Korea had been divided four ways among the United States, the Soviet Union, the Republic of China, and the United Kingdom, as was first proposed, or if the Soviets had been given free reign to invade all of Korea and be done with it. In this latter instance, there would have been no Korean War, for certain, merely a Leninist satrapy in the Far East that most probably would have withered and died, as did other Soviet satellite states. This is really interesting. North Korea, one bad decision with a map. You want to tell that story? Extraordinary, and it involves a man with a wonderful name, Charles Hartwell Bonesteel III, <laughs> who in the picture in the book has wearing an eye patch because he had had <laughs> surgery, I think. He was the man who, he and a chap called Dean Rusk, who later went on to be American Secretary of State under President Kennedy, were two young colonels. They were in the office of George Marshall, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, in 1945, 14th of August. It was the 15th of August over in Japan. And they were listening on shortwave radio to the thin and reedy voice of Emperor Hirohito announcing the war has not gone necessarily to our advantage. We're surrendering. Mm. So both of these young colonels said, OK, so... The Japanese problem is over. The big problem now is the Soviet Union, because they had joined the war just a week previously, cynically, and were now marching down through Sakhalin Island, through Manchuria, mopping up the Japanese troops, and in Korea. And uh, Bone Steel and Rusk said they've got to be stopped. They've got to be asked to stop. Otherwise, these parts of the world will be entirely Soviet. And back then, this was the beginning of the Cold War, Soviet meant danger. So. They got out a National Geographic map, the kind that used to be tucked into magazines, of the Pacific Ocean. And Bonesteel looked at it and noticed that San Francisco and Seoul were almost exactly 
on the same parallel. They were about 37, 30 north. And he said to himself, and he said to uh, Rusk, I think we Americans should, as Seoul is the old capital, we should control Seoul. And Rusk said yes. So he took his Chinagraph pencil and drew a line along the 38th parallel and took it into George Marshall, who said, um, yeah, 38th parallel, that seems reasonable. Let's do it. Let's ask the Russians if they'll stop their advance. So they took this to the State Department, who signaled Moscow. And incredibly, Moscow said, yeah, actually, we're getting a bit tired. We'll stop our tanks and our soldiers <laughs> at the 38th parallel. And out of this, two countries were born, because the puppet chosen by uh, the Soviets was Kim Il-sung. And in America, they chose a different puppet down south, Sing Man Ri, and two countries the DPRK in the north mm. and the ROK in the south, divided, as you now know, by you know, four-kilometre-wide DMZ and all the rest of it. Um, the ultimate irony is I write in the book about the capture of the USS Pueblo in 1968, when the sailors, there were 80 of them, were finally released after 11 months of torture and misery. They walked back over the Bridge of No Return into the freedom of the South Korea, and they were greeted by the now general commanding the uh, troops in South Korea, General Charles Hartwell Bonesteel III, who had created the mess in the first place by incautiously drawing a line on a National Geographic map. So it's all the Americans' fault. And if we just let them go, well, I should say we, but if they just yeah. let them go. And it had become an all Soviet Korean peninsula, it would, as I say in the book, I think, have, have, have withered and died. I mean, hmm. communism has, as essentially, did. as Vietnam yeah. did, exactly. Yeah. And there would have been no war, no misery. I mean, and the... 55,000 people died well, exactly. in that Korean yeah, War. Yeah, exactly. Uh, can I ask you about the Aussies? Are they still speaking to you? Well, I don't know. The book has just been published <laughs> uh, in Australia. The reviews have been generally kind Should of we news. say? Should we say? You say Australia is a non-Pacific nation and not a great country, I think is the quote. Well, I think, no, I said it's a great place to live in, but not a great country, not yet. That's, <laughs> and I was quoting an Australian okay. who said that. Okay. But, I mean, the big problem for Australia is, is it a Pacific nation or is it an outpost of, of the United Kingdom? Is it a, a little... Uh, and, and New Zealand faces the same problem, too. Um, and Australia has been grappling with this. I mean, the, 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 the white Australia policy, which for many years restricted, savagely restricted... Um, the Asian uh, uh, immigration into Australia has left its mark not just on the, the look and feel of the cities of Australia but on the psyche of the people. And there are a lot of people, I, I quote this extraordinary woman Pauline Hanson who until very recently was sitting in, the, in Canberra in the, in the, in the uh, legislature vehemently anti-letting any non-white person into Australia. And um, not surprisingly, the neighbours to the north, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, say, well, in that case, you're not really playing a part in the sort of brotherhood, the community which we're trying to create. Um, but to be perfectly honest with you, the Australians I've spoken to in the last week or so have agreed, have said, yeah, we're, we're ashamed of people like Pauline Hanson. Our future belongs not with Britain anymore. I mean, that was fine. That was how we were created 150 years ago. But now all our trade is with China. I mean, the amount of coal and other raw materials we send there, we should be at one with... We're part of the Western Pacific. We're not, any, we're not an outlier of Britain. And I think, I think generally the intelligent Australians are sympathetic to this view. But I'll be going there in February. Who knows how many cabbages <laughs> will be thrown at me. We'll see. They may have a new prime minister by then, too. They seem to go through well, them I rather think, rapidly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's quite... Let's talk technology. A high-tech innovation story. One of the biggest events to affect the Pacific is the creation of the transistor radio. Transistor created in New Jersey in the United States, the first transistor radio created by an American company. So, how did Sony, a Japanese company with not a Japanese name, come to take over the world with this gadget? It is extraordinary. They, they, there was this man, Masaru Ibuka, who was he and a fellow called Akio Morita, we know Morita, created Sony. Most people have forgotten Ibuka, who was a, you know, dirt under his fingernails engineer. And he was fascinated by the transistor when he read about it, uh, being created at Bell Labs in, in New Jersey by Shockley and his team. And he was determined that the future of this little company, Tokyo Telecommunications Company, which would go on to be called Sony, depended on things that could be done 
with this new device, this transistor. Mm -hmm. And so he came over to New York and a very famous moment when he was in, I think, the Roxy Hotel in southern Manhattan, and he decided to get the license. And he bought it for $25,000, which was an enormous sum of money in those days. Good uh, investment, though. Very good investment. <laughs> they brought it back. They, they learned how to make, adapt Bell Labs technology with what's called phosphor doping. I won't go into the technicalities of it, but basically they made a transistor which was powerful enough to power a small radio set, and they made it. It was called the TR55. And where was it launched? Where was it first launched outside Canada, uh, outside Japan? It was launched here in Canada, in Winnipeg, in Calgary, and Vancouver. Suddenly, Canadians who had hitherto been using as their radio sets things which were covered in walnut and were pieces of furniture. Mm -hmm. You put the aspidistra on it and you tuned it in and it warmed up and did things like uh, drifted off station and so forth and, uh, and cooled down. Suddenly, a little thing no bigger than your shirt pocket appeared in the stores in Winnipeg, in Winnipeg of all places, <laughs> that you could take the radio outside, you could put it you know, beside your bottle of beer and listen to the ball game while you were out in the garden. It transformed people's lives. And Sony, back in, in, in Japan, realized it was onto something, and miniaturization became the name of the game. And so this man Ibuka invented things that have become very familiar. The Walkman, if you remember that. Mm, sure. The Trinitron television, mm. the technology of which is all around us today. Betamax, perhaps not the greatest of successes, and the arc of, of Sony's um, existence, I mean, it's now not doing so well, uh, is one of the remarkable success stories. Because think of all the thousands of container ships filled with Sony and Panasonic and all the other products coming from Tokyo and Yokohama to Seattle and Portland and Vancouver, and then that same technology being used by first the Koreans, Samsung and people like that, and now, of course, by the Chinese. So it all say, started with this little radio set. When we were kids, it was made in Japan. Made right? in Today Japan. it's made in China, but back then it was made in Japan. It certainly was, yeah. Mm. And Sony, maybe just take a second on this. I, I think I grew up thinking that that stood for Sound of New York, but it certainly doesn't, right? No, it, it doesn't. They wanted a four-letter word. They, mm. I mean, their, their company was called Totsko, or TTK, but that sort of doesn't really work. And so uh, Morita and his chums said, we need a four-letter word like Ford. Ford is a great name. Mm. Kodak is a great name. So we want to invent something. And they thought Sonos, Latin for sound, because these things produced sound. And they remembered a song, Al Jolson, about Sonny Boy. And they <laughs> thought so and American GIs would toss gum to the Japanese kids and say, there you go, Sonny. So something Sonos and Sonny and they adopted it into S-O-N-Y, and of course the name is stuck. It sure has. One more excerpt from the book. The statistics tell the story. Tokyo has been falling from grace as a container cargo export hub for many years. At the last count, the Japanese capital was 32nd in the world table. And a further statistic applies, giving some clue to the realization that the only container vessels I saw that summer's day were inbound, bringing imports to Japan and not exports bound for the rest of the world. Most probably, the imports were televisions and laptop computers because, incredibly, Japan in 2014 became a net importer of such devices 40 years after essentially creating the industry and then dominating the field. How did that happen? It's largely cost. I mean, the Chinese engineers, I mean, it's all copycat work. There's no doubt about it. There was very little in the 80s and 90s true innovation, technological innovation in China. But when Deng Xiaoping made that speech, you know, to get riches glorious and started ramping up the industrial production of China, um, they could do anything they liked and much more cheaply. So they simply took the Japanese and the Korean technology, built the assembly lines in Shanghai and outside Beijing and Wuhan and further inland Chongqing, and started churning out these devices at a quarter of the price. <laughs> um, which, of course, gets us to the whole issue about uh, about trade today and the way that the Chinese workers are treated. Um, we well know the sorry tale of Apple and Foxconn and the incredibly poor working conditions and workers and suicides, committing suicides and things yes. like that. And so the whole, uh, I don't know if we're going to be talking about the TPP, but the whole um, business about the, the new Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, which countries involved in our beginning to ratify in their home legislatures, um, whether China 
should become part of it. And the problem is that the TPP requires labor regulation so that in the factories in Vietnam or uh, the United States or wherever, Chile, are well organized um, and uh, kindly to their workers, if I can put it like that, which clearly does not happen in China. So China would love to be part of the TPP, but the Americans and the other partners say, well, not until you clean up your labor practices. And they say, well, if we clean up, clean up our labor practices, our prices are going to go sky high, so we won't be able to compete in the world market anymore. So it's a big dilemma. But at the moment, that's how the Chinese do it, cheapness. Let's finish up on this. You are at the moment in the province of Ontario, which is a stone's throw from the Atlantic Ocean as the world turns. And so we tend to think of ourselves in this part of Canada as, of course, being an Atlantic or northern seaboard, northeastern seaboard nation. Uh, if you were doing this interview in Vancouver, of course, uh, Canada is very much a Pacific nation in that case. Canada doesn't figure big in this book of yours, even though, of course, millions of Canadians think of themselves as being a Pacific country. How come? Yes, I suppose I'm slightly embarrassed about that, and I know I'm going to face a similar question in, in New Zealand. I think it was... Uh, and, and, and my American editor it was very critical of me putting so much about Australia in the book. I mean, Australia figures in the weather chapter, figures in the coral bleaching chapter, and it figures in a big chapter about Australia. So you can't please everybody. I mean, <laughs> the, that's one of the b dilemmas about writing about an ocean which is so vast with so many competing if you like, personalities, <coughs> nationalities. I dare say the Melanesians will say we didn't get as much space as the Polynesians got. How come? <laughs> so uh, may I say publicly, I apologise to Can Canadians who might feel slighted, but I have no doubt at all that from Vancouver to Bella Coola to the, uh, to the Alaskan border, Canada's Pacific is highly important. <laughs> and I, if there's another edition, I'll make sure it's even better treated than now. We just look forward to your next book, which the title will be Canada, Why I Love You So Much. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the name of this one is called Pacific. And on this continent, the subtitle is Silicon Chips and Surfboards, Coral Reefs and Atom Bombs, Brutal Dictators, Fading Empires, and the Coming Collision of the World's Superpowers. I'm totally out of breath now. Simon Winchester, so great to meet you, and thanks for visiting us here at TVO tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.